Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii, where we discuss the impact of change on workers, employers, and the economy. I'm your host, Cheryl Crozier Garcia, inviting you to join us live here in the studio. And you can do that by calling area code 808-374-2014 with your questions or comments, or tweet us at thinktechhi. Today we're gonna do something a little bit different. We are going to celebrate the boys of summer, specifically our Hawaii Little League team that won this past weekend the uh, World Series uh, for Little League Baseball. Our Hawaii boys did really, really well, and the final game versus Japan was phenomenal. So what's next for these elite athletes uh, in the bodies of young men? Well, joining us today to talk about uh, the opportunities that are part of winning these kinds of uh, very prestigious games is Coach Darren Vorderbergi from Hawaii Pacific University. Coach V is the um, uh, head basketball coach and he is well experienced in college recruiting for scholar athletes, and he's gonna tell us today how our Hawaii boys can position themselves to take advantage of the opportunities that are going to come to them as a result of winning the uh, Little League World Series. Welcome, Coach. Well, good, glad to be here. Thanks mm -hmm. for having me. It's always good to talk to you. Appreciate that. Um, so our Hawaii boys have endeared themselves uh, within the sporting community because they won the Little League uh, World Series and I watched uh, the semifinals and finals of those games. And to be honest, they are as good as professional players, I think. No errors. Um, they may not pitch as fast or hit as hard as adult players, but in terms of the skills that are necessary, I think, to play in the big leagues, our boys have it. Um, and it's always nice to see Hawaii people do well in these kinds of national and international competitions. Um, tell us about some of the Hawaii people that have, uh, have differentiated themselves from the pack by doing well in sports. Who do we have yeah. that we can use as examples? You know, we, um, we've lived here for about 13 years now, and uh, my whole life has been connected with sports. So it's been a, a joy for me to to study the history of sports and, and in Hawaii and, and what a great sports community this is. Um, it, it was a good weekend. UH won their first football game and Hawaii won the Little League World Series. A friend of mine was sending that out over social media that uh, with the impending hurricane, it was kind of nice to get a couple pieces of great news. But congratulations to the, the Little League team. You know, what, what a way to represent your, your family, your, your community. Um, you know, there's been some talk that a lot of those guys, prior to the two previous uh, teams that had won the Little League World Series, this was a lot of the more central Oahu kids that, mm -hmm. that came from the area that we're not too far from right now. So, um, and Hawaii has tremendous baseball uh, tradition. I don't know a lot of people know it, but there's a, a guy named Cartwright who's buried up Nu'uanu, uh, near the Nu'uanu Judd intersection. Uh, who's credited with inventing baseball. There's a big debate over whether Doubleday or Cartwright invented it, and most people think that Cartwright really invented it and then mm -hmm. came here and was a, a fireman. But you know, Hawaii's just a baseball state. There's so many things that contribute to it. Uh, it we've got the, the culture. It's an outdoor state. You can be outdoors playing all the time. Uh, as you've mentioned, other tradition we have, I was the athletic director at HPU in 2010, when the, our women's softball team won the national championship for NCAA mm -hmm. Division II. Mm -hmm. And again, it's that baseball softball culture that, that Hawaii has excelled at exceptionally. Uh, Colton Wong is, is playing pro professionally, uh, the Flying Hawaiian uh, played for Philadelphia. I mean, we've just had so much um, success in that area. And these guys, I think, uh, this young team that just had success can credit to those people. You know, you hear that a lot, but I think people really do need to take a deep breath and remember the way has been paved for us. Yeah. You know, there's, there's a tradition of people that have gone before us so that we can do the things that we're capable of doing now. Right, and I certainly remember going back, 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 back to the old school days 
um, of course, Shane Victorino from Maui right. uh, with the Phillies. And also, going even further back, Sid Fernandez with the Mets. Right. Kaiser and, grad. That's right. And um, Derek Tatsuno, a Pearl right. City High School grad, who went on to greater fame playing, uh, playing uh, professional ball in Japan. Uh -huh. So it isn't only. Benny Agbayani from HPU. That's right. Benny played Agbayani. For the Mets and then also had a successful Japanese career. Right. So uh, our boys that won this weekend are following a legacy, right. uh, a, a, a path that was paved for them by guys like Shane Victorino, Derek Tatsuno, all those folks. And it isn't only, I think, in baseball that we have a history of really phenomenal world class athletes, certainly in football. Rich Miano, Russ Francis, um, Marcus Mariota, Marcus Manti Mariota. Teo, mm -hmm. uh, DeForest Buckner's playing with the 49ers right mm -hmm. now. I just saw his, I think I was in Jack in the Box the other day, and there's a life size poster of him in there. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and we have dominated sumo yes. for the last, what, 50 years? Yeah. I mean, um, Jesse Kuhalua, wrestling under the name Sekiwaki. Uh, was the first non-Japanese to ever win a sumo tournament. Right. And then, of course, we have Akebono and Konishiki and Musashi Maru and some of the other big, big, big uh, sumo names. And when I say big in sumo, I don't necessarily <laughs> mean in size. I, I mean in terms of reputation, right. uh, fan base, and, and winning championships. So Hawaii really has, um, in a lot of ways, uh, not only created um, a, uh, a legacy for athletes going forward, but I think there's also kind of a uh, idea in Hawaii that in some ways we may not be good enough to compete on the world stage. I don't know where that came from, but it does sometimes seem to be like, oh, we cannot, we cannot play at that league or at that level, et cetera. So what do you think about that? And how do we, how do we get people to, to realistically understand that they can be just as good from Hawaii as they can be from other places? I think there's a couple things at play there. Um, one is, I think, culturally in Hawaii, uh, compared to many other states that I've been to, uh, there is a humbleness, there's a humility uh, that, that I've sensed that, that kind of lends itself to not being arrogant. And, and you have to be careful because I, I believe humility is a positive thing and coaches always teach that. But, you know, we always say that Humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. Mm -hmm. Not being so self-centered, but to be humble doesn't mean that, oh, well, I'm no good. Uh, but I, I, I think sometimes you have to be careful, because you can be humble, but also be confident. Right. Uh, I think another thing at play is that in Hawaii, we don't always get the experience and competition that other people get. Uh, a, a little league team from Kansas can drive down and play Oklahoma teams or take a bus trip and play Colorado or maybe a team from Missouri will come there. But we don't get that. In mm -hmm. Hawaii, our little league team, you know, unless it saved up and washed a lot of cars and sold some candy bars and was able to get a sponsor and maybe go make one weekend or week trip, they don't get that same experience. So I think sometimes that internalizes we haven't played as many people. We're not sure how we would do against outside competition. Mm -hmm. So it's always so valuable when these teams achieve at the level that, that this team just achieved from. And like I said, the people that have gone before that, that was mentioned to these guys. Mm -hmm. Hey, we've won the World, Little League World Series before. And these guys knew going into it, we can do that. Uh, we, you know, we don't need to be scared of anybody or anything. Yeah. And these guys have done that now for a team in the future that will refer back to, hey, the 2018 team did this. We can do it in 2020. I hope so. I'd like to see us win five, six years undefeated yeah, in a be row. Awesome. With, with Little League as well as with other sports. Right. Um, you know, certainly HPU has a history, not only with the women's softball team, but basketball. We have done a number of division championships. Right. Um, but you're right, it is a lot of Portuguese sausage <laughs> and car washes and uh, lot, raffle tickets and carnivals and all this kind of thing in order to uh, raise enough money. And it costs big money, doesn't it, to send 15 or 16 athletes plus whatever chaperones are necessary, plus the equipment, plus the coaching staff, et cetera. Uh, we could be talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah, it's expensive. And then, you know, it's a different dynamic when when the Hawaii team goes over to California for a tournament, 
they're also on vacation. Uh, you know, I know a lot of times they'll, they'll go to Disneyland because, hey, we're over here, which is great. Um, they'll go visit colleges. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of coaches will say, hey, well, we're over there. Let's go visit two or three universities. So, so while we're here, you can get that experience. So even sometimes when the teams are over there, it's not completely a business trip. And the California teams that are there, well, they live there. Mm -hmm. So they, they are more focused. So that's just an additional challenge that Hawaii teams have when they're on the road and they're not staying in their own beds and they're playing local teams in the California area or wherever they've gone. Sure. Not to mention things like jet lag. Right. Um, if they're playing in Colorado, issues with altitude sickness and different events like that, weather issues. I remember looking at high school bands in the Macy's mm -hmm. Thanksgiving Day Parade, and they literally, they, I don't know why they have this, but they have girls dressed in semi-hula kind of attire, <laughs> and they have to wear body stockings and uh, long um, things underneath their uniforms because it's so stinking right. cold. For us, it's cold. That's right. Now, yeah. the New York people are running around like, woohoo, whatever, but uh, our Hawaii kids are shivering. Yeah, it's so so a these the weather issues, the jet lag, and all of that that has to be overcome too. How do you train for something like that? I think part of it is preparing ahead of time that this is the mission of our trip. And I got the sense uh, from watching the guys, uh, the little league team, that they had done a good job. You know, we're going here to be successful in baseball. You know, when we get a chance, we might do some fun stuff along the way. Maybe it's community service. Maybe it's visit a uh, uh, a, a university, maybe it's go to the hotel swimming pool, but if you do your work ahead of time and the guys have traveled previously, they know that, hey, if we've raised this money or if people are investing in us to go over here to play baseball, that needs to be our primary focus. Mm -hmm. It's not a vacation. Mm -hmm. And then coaches do a good job of, hey, we need to eat similar to how we've been eating. We need to get to bed at a similar time. And you know, coaches can overthink that at times. I've caught myself doing that. You know, well, I want to get in this routine. Every little thing matters. But it is important to be aware of the details. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I was uh, speaking of coaches. I was, uh, as you know, the Little League World Series championship game took place this past weekend. At the same time, the rest of us were hunkering down <laughs> and waiting for the storm to come. Right. And I was especially impressed. They did a press conference as the Hawaii team had been named to go into the finals. And the coach actually got teary-eyed about how, you know, we're, we're really playing for the folks back home who are trying to overcome uh, the storm, et cetera. So how does that also play into how well the kids do? Because um, they were worried about their families just the same as everybody else was. Yeah, and, and you know, being an older guy, uh, having lived in many different places and, and several states and then come to Hawaii for these last few years of my life, um, you know, Hawaii's a unique place. Um, you know, and I don't know, I, I've always sensed, I don't know if this is the right word, if we don't, we got a little chip on our shoulder, I, I've almost sensed to develop that myself. Sometimes you feel a little slighted, you feel, you know, people, have, on the mainland will say, hey, when are you coming back to the States? Well, we're in the States, okay? Um, and you just, you feel like you get overlooked sometimes. Um, and I think that can be used as a positive, as we talked about a minute ago. You know, as long as you don't take that as, well, we're inferior, but, you know, we, we've seen different cultures all through history that, hey, if I got to overcome something, that's gonna be a good motivational tool. I think Hawaii has some of that. I've tried to internalize that myself. So when, you, when I saw the people on TV talking about, hey, we're playing for the, the people back home and the storm, you, you know, the storm was an added um, impetus and, and it did add some emotion to it. But even without that, Hawaii more than other states, you play for your state when you're on the road. Yeah. I, I just, there's something about it. I, I didn't experience that till I moved here. I, I lived in Kansas and Missouri and, and traveled all over the, the country and the world playing basketball or coaching basketball. And it was only until I got here and went to California, I've gone to Alaska, you know, Oregon, and you've got Hawaii Pacific University, you've got Hawaii on your chest. There's a different level of pride. It's like, hey, we're the, we're the unique state. We're the ones out in the ocean that sometimes you overlook and sometimes you don't think about. I think the storm was just a, an additional something to that. Mm -hmm. 
you know, we this time is really just flying, and we need to go to break already. All right. So uh, everyone, stay tuned. Uh, we're going to take a look now at some of the other great programming here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Cheryl Kerzer Garcia. This is Working Together, and we will be back in 60 seconds. Are you tired of sleepwalking through life? Are you dreaming of a healthier, wealthier, happier you? You're not alone, and that's why thousands of people tune in each week to watch R.B. Kelly on Out of the Comfort Zone, Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Make a change, get the help you need, and stop sucking at life. The Army, we're about to go live. Oh. Hello, it's 1 p.m. on a Tuesday afternoon, and I'm your host, R.B. Kelly. Welcome to Out of the Comfort Zone. When I was growing up, I was among the one in six American kids who struggle with hunger, and hungry mornings make tired days. Grumpy days. Bleh kind of days. But with the power of breakfast, the kids in your neighborhood can think big and be more. When we're not hungry for breakfast, we're hungry for more. More ideas. More dreams. More fun. When kids aren't hungry for breakfast, they can be hungry for more. Go to hungeris.org and lend your time or your voice to make breakfast happen for kids in your neighborhood. Welcome back to Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Cheryl Crozier Garcia, and we are talking baseball with uh, Coach Darren Verderbrugge at Hawaii Pacific University. So, Coach, uh, we have these world champion little league athletes. Um, they have kind of differentiated themselves from the rest of little league players because they won the World Series. And now I'm guessing that they will be on the receiving end of a lot of attention from college scouts and coaches who are looking to build baseball teams uh, for their respective universities in the future. Right. How can these boys position themselves to be uh, seen as the kinds of players that these coaches and scouts want to recruit for their universities? I think that's a great question. Uh, and having spent my life uh, around student athletes the last 30 years on the high school side and then the last 20 so on the on the college side, I've, I've been fortunate to see both sides of that, uh, and, and I, even my son was a collegiate student athlete, so I got to go through it as a parent, and that can be daunting for for student athletes and for parents. Uh, you know, they may go through that one time in their life mm -hmm. when their student, you know, maybe they went to college, maybe they didn't, maybe or not, they were a student athlete as a parent. And oftentimes not, so they have no experience. So I think it can be overwhelming because you're dealing with coaches and schools that do this all day, every day. So mm -hmm. it's a business to them and they're recruiting. Uh, the Little League World Series championship is great resume material. Um, and those guys can put that on there and, and hopefully build on that. And part of the, again, we talked earlier about the the humility of Hawaii, and the you, know, you have to be careful with that. People, people obviously want people who aren't bragging and, and full of themselves and not going to be team players. But you have to sell yourself if you want to play college athletics. It's it's not like Hollywood where now everyone's going to coaches are going to be lined up knocking on your door, and when you open your mailbox, it's going to be full of letters. You know that happens to the top handful of baseball and basketball players, of football and basketball players. Uh, it, it does not happen to 99% of the athletes in, in, in the world. I think one, one bit of advice I could give that, that I've seen, I think students and parents need to talk, do I want to play college athletics? Mm -hmm. um, so many players don't maintain or don't don't have the retention and get through four years. It's, it's rare, um, but it's their identity. They've been playing since they were five. Uh, they played throughout school and they enjoyed it more than they enjoyed class and they've had success and that's their friend group and that's how they've gotten attention. And it's hard for them to picture, I'm not going to be an athlete. I mean, we see Michael Jordan and Muhammad Ali have trouble picturing, what am I gonna do? You know, keep hitting me and let me play, let me keep boxing longer than I should because I don't know what to do next. 
So I, I would really encourage parents and students to have that conversation and for parents to be able to support students if they say, I just want to get my degree and, and move on to my next phase of life, maybe four years earlier than you thought I was going to. And, and I'm not trying to discourage people from being college athletes, but it's a different level of commitment right. at the collegiate level. And I think that deserves at least a conversation before you move on. Now, baseball is, is unique too in that more than other sports, they draft out of high school. And, and there's this track which is much similar, much more similar to soccer in Europe where, hey, if you wanna go play professionally, you focus on that now and then get your degree later. And you and I as educators kind of bristle at that sometimes and think, oh, but the education is so important. But that's the nature and the design of baseball in America. So it's very common that students have to make a decision, okay, I've been drafted. 316th by the St. Louis Cardinals, or I'm being offered a scholarship that'll pay me um, $5,000 towards my tuition at, at UC Davis, you know, which do I want to do? And again, that takes a lot of consideration. I think you, you've right. got to think about that and, okay, what's the best route for me? And will I be able to come back and get my degree if this doesn't work out? And mm -hmm. uh, so a lot goes into baseball. It's a unique, uh, it's a unique animal. Yeah, that's true. Um, and I think it's important to note, especially for our championship players, that it isn't only athletic prowess that's going to get you on the team and keep you on the team at the university level. Uh, the term scholar-athlete, notice, scholar comes first. It's right. not athlete-scholar, it's right. the other way around. So what kinds of um, scholarly achievement are you looking for uh, when you are drafting potential players? So much is dependent on academic success. There, are, there is criteria that you have to meet by the NCAA to be eligible. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, that varies a little bit, you know, 2.3 at this, with this ACT score or this ACT, SAT. So there, there's a little scale there, but the, the NCAA has standards, but then each school has standards. It's, I every year have to explain to young man, yes, you're eligible. The NCAA has made you, you're eligible. I don't know any place you can get into school though. I mean, mm -hmm. you might have to go to a junior college. You might have to go to, you might have to really beat the doors down because every school then has additional standards that it's trying to recruit students to. Also, you can make yourself more attractive to coaches. It's very important that, that people realize most student athletes do not get a full scholarship. That's, that's a myth. Most, a lot of people think that, but most student athletes are getting couple thousand dollars towards their $25,000 tuition. Maybe they're getting $10,000. And then with that, they'll put some academic money, maybe some Pell Grant and they'll partner things. So the better you've done academically, the more attractive you are to a coach because he'll say, hey, I'll give you 10,000 in athletic money, but you're also getting 15,000 in academic money so I can package you to get you to where it will cover your tuition. Right. So there's so many, there, there's no negatives and only positives to being a high achieving student. You know, the, the third component, you know, the coaches are going to initially have their eye caught by your athletic achievement. Then it becomes grades. And then the third thing that every coach I know just puts a, a primary focus on is what kind of person are you? How mm -hmm. are you going to fit with a team? And watching this Little League team and, and some of the videos they made and, and the fun they were having, but how tight they were, you can tell that they're loaded, I think, with what you would just call good teammates. Mm -hmm. Because even if you're a great player and, and you've got great grades, the coaches do not want to bring someone on that's going to be a distraction. Somebody that's uncoachable, uh, somebody that doesn't get along with others, that is selfish, uh, that's negative or backstabbing for their players. I think in, in general, it's just a, a rule of thumb for young people as they're preparing for, hey, what's the team I want to be on next? You know, hey, where am I at as a player, as a student, and as a person? Mm -hmm. How important is it for, say, kids that have uh, set a goal to play professional ball in any sport, uh, how important is it for them to, to finish college? But it varies sport by sport. Uh -huh. I mean, you know, 
Uh, baseball is a different track than other sports. Tennis is rarely do collegiate players go from tennis on. Uh, golf is kind of 50-50, a lot of golfers. Uh, basketball, it's, it's important that the students go. You know, you hear the one and done rule. Uh, so it varies across the map. I think the, the important thing for student athletes that, that have that dream to play professional is to realize, okay, that's, that's a long-term goal. That's down there. And then to back away from that, okay, right before I would play professional, what, where would I be? Mm -hmm. and, and before there, where would I be? You know, would I be in college? Would, would, what would my height, what would my weight be? What would my strength and my speed be? And you have to dial that all the way back to where you are now and say, okay, how do I just get to that next step? Right. And, right. and instead of thinking, how do I get to the Lakers? It's, okay, how do I get to the point where I'm highly recruitable to, to the NCAA schools right. and, and do those next steps. Mm -hmm. And with baseball, doesn't that sometimes mean that perhaps instead of taking a straight to university route, you're thinking farm team? Like you're thinking uh, AAA ball or you're thinking one of, the, one of the teams within a particular major league teams. Um, uh, so instead, say, of going right to the Twins, you're going to play for two years with the St. Cloud River Bats. Right. And that's um, very common, that you, you'll be in a, a single A, a double A, a triple A team. And, and what I would encourage my son, if he were a baseball player, is don't rely on that. Give yourself the option, as we were talking about earlier, if I've been drafted and I've got that opportunity as a senior in high school and I have the opportunity to, to be a student athlete in college, I'd like to have the power. I'd like to have the choice to make that rather than I really can't go to college. My grades aren't good enough. Coaches aren't looking at me. My only hope is this route. Mm -hmm. And it'd be nice to, for a student to, or a young person to be empowered to make that decision of, okay, I, I, I want to try to play professionally, but I'm doing it by my choice and I'm looking at it, you know, and maybe a year of college and then it even happens you can be drafted after your freshman, sophomore year of college. I think the, every year older you get, your chance for being success on the road, around young men, and, and being away from home in that professional sport environment goes up. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'd rather my son win at 20 than 19. I'd rather he'd go at 19 than 18. And every year of, of college you get to, you just grow so much. At least sure. everybody I'm around, you know, they're, they're opening their mind, they're, they're learning new things about society and, and how to think and, and think for themselves and have original thoughts that you're not going to get with the St. Cloud mud dogs or <laughs> It's the river bats. The river bats, that's it. Excuse me. <laughs> so I, I think that the, the more you can get to that collegiate level and have some experience, the more that will carry with you throughout your life. Right. And I think it's important to note, too, that it's, for in my mind, it's important to have a degree, even if you do decide to play pro ball, because what happens if you get too hurt to play before your career is really over age-wise? Uh, and then you have nothing to fall back on. Exactly. I mean, you've got, to, you've got to support a family whether you have knee injuries or not. And that's where I would, you know, if I had a child and, and they were looking at, okay, I've got the op an opportunity to play professionally. Um, and, and we even see that some at, at the Division II level in basketball. There'll be a contract in Italy pops up or a contract in, to go play basketball in Japan. Mm -hmm. And my counsel with those kids, uh, those young people, is always, are you in a position that you you will get back and finish your degree? Mm -hmm. are, are, are you going to give up a scholarship now that you, in a couple years, it's like, well, now that I don't have that scholarship, I won't get it back. Right. Ugh. But if it's like, hey, take this opportunity, go for it, but make sure that you can get that degree. You, you've put in some time. You're, you're too close to give up on it. Right. You know, that's a good place to end. So uh, to all of you out there who were part of the World Series World Championship team from Hawaii, congratulations, guys. You are bomb, and you did a fantastic job representing the state. Uh, but don't think your career is over. You've still got many, many years ahead of you, and we will look forward to seeing great things from you in the future. Uh, on behalf of all the citizen journalists here at Think Tech Hawaii, I'm Cheryl Crozier-Garcia, and we will be back in two weeks. Till then, take care.